Father, we thank you for these ancient words. Come now by the power of your Holy Spirit. You open our hearts that we might hear, that we might understand, that you might draw us to your throne of grace. Jesus, we ask this in your mighty name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, happy Pentecost Sunday to everyone as we celebrate the, uh, the amazing Acts 2 day where God opened up the heavens and poured his Holy Spirit uh, upon his people. Uh, and in the midst of uh, doing an Acts series that, that we've been in for quite a while now, it's a little bit anticlimactic to have a Pentecost Sunday, right? Because uh, I feel like every Sunday has been Pentecost Sunday for uh, since uh, September when uh, we began all of this. Uh, in fact, you know, Acts can be referred to as Acts of the Apostles, but there's many people that, that refer to it as Acts of the Holy Spirit, because it's very clear throughout the book of Acts who's in charge, that the Holy Spirit is at work guiding the hearts and minds of the, of the disciples and the apostles and what's going on in the early church. In fact, so far, as we've been looking through uh, Acts together up to this point, we've seen the Holy Spirit working to, to empower uh, for the witness of the gospel to others. We've seen the Holy Spirit speaking through the scriptures. We've seen fillings of the Holy Spirit for the work of evangelism. Uh, we've seen the, the, the Holy Spirit filling uh, and anointing people to speak in in foreign tongues in such a way that those who were gathered from different nations could all hear the gospel proclaimed. Uh, we've seen the Holy Spirit poured out to fill the hearts of the believers with boldness for the, for the witness and for the mission they're on. Uh, we've seen the Holy Spirit filling uh, the disciples with prophetic words. We've seen the Holy Spirit directing Philip's steps on where he was to go We've seen the Holy Spirit comforting the church, speaking to the elders at Antioch through their prayers, telling them to send out Paul and Barnabas on mission, and speaking through the Jerusalem council when they met together. We've seen the Holy Spirit at work through everything. There's nothing that's happened that we've read that the Holy Spirit hasn't been directing uh, and guiding. Acts is a book of the work of the Holy Spirit. And today, the work of the Holy Spirit we're looking at in particular is the work of the Holy Spirit in guiding our lives, in guiding our lives. That's where we are uh, in our passage in Acts 16 this morning. How does the Spirit guide our lives? How do we see it at work here in this particular passage? Uh, and there's four ways that, that we're going to talk about just at work in this passage alone. There, there's more, but, uh, and, and they're through four Ps. I've been wanting to do four-point alliteration forever. It never seems to work out. And I will admit, I may have stretched it just a little bit, but I'll get there. I'll explain it. Uh, the four Ps of, of the Holy Spirit's guidance are these, prohibition, permission, Perception and persuasion. Yeah, very impressive, right? Uh, <laughs> one of them you'll see, I kind of took a little bit of liberties, but I'm going to explain it. We're, we're going to get there as we uh, work through these uh, four Ps of the Holy Spirit's guidance in our lives as we see it at work in, in Acts 16. So let's start in, uh, in verse 6 together and just read the first two verses, uh, and I want to talk about them for just a moment. We're told, and they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come to Mycenae, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. This is a first so far in the book of Acts that we've read what the Holy Spirit's doing. Uh, we have not seen this prohibition before, uh, but two things happened. They're told that they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go into Asia, and they, the Holy Spirit did not allow them, didn't allow them to go where they had planned to go. First time this prohibition is mentioned. So how did this exactly work, this, uh, this forbidding and this not allowing? You know, I don't know if you, you ever think about it, you ever stop to just wonder, because we're not told 
we're, we're not told how exactly the forbidding or the prohibition worked here. And, you know, if you're like me, my mind goes to some kind of Hollywood scene, right, of uh, them kind of walking up to the... Uh, up to uh, the, the road where the sign says this way to Asia and there's just a, an invisible wall and they can't get through it, right? Something spectacular has happened, something incredibly supernatural. But that's not really the picture that we're, we're getting here. In fact, if it were something that were that supernatural, we got to believe that Luke would have told us about it. He would have wanted us to know about something that was so amazing that would give glory to God in some special way, but he doesn't. Which leads us to conclude that this wasn't some sort of supernatural, obvious, awe-inspiring event, but rather this prevention was through just kind of normal, everyday kind of circumstances, ones that could easily be confused that this wasn't the Holy Spirit's working, this was just circumstance. You know, imagine it being something like maybe someone got sick and they they couldn't make the journey. Uh, maybe it was something like a natural disaster, a, uh, a flood happened, and the, w- the road got washed out, and they just weren't able to, to get there. It, it's something that's like, you know, not quite as uh, Hollywood spectacular, you know, but, but nevertheless, ways that the Lord works in prohibiting us to go in a direction that he doesn't want us to go. And another thing that Luke doesn't tell us, and by the way, this is the first time in, in, uh, in Acts where we go, Luke goes from telling us about them to telling us about we. This is where Luke joins with Paul and Silas and Timothy on this journey with them. And so he's now a firsthand reporter uh, of what's going on in their lives. But, you know, he, he also doesn't tell us, you know, it had to be incredibly frustrating, you know, to not be able to go. They had a plan. They had a plan. This is what they were doing. And they felt this is what the Lord, this was the mission he had called them on. And they were being faithful and they were going where it was leading. But they were forbidden to go into Asia and that they were not allowed to go on uh, into, into Galatia as well. You know, it's, uh, it had to have been frustrating for them. Or sorry, they weren't allowed to go into Bithynia. But it had to be frustrating. It had to be disappointing. What's going on here, Lord? I'm just trying to do your will. I'm just trying to please you. I'm just trying to live into the mission. And, you, and, and, you're, and everything's working against me here. What's going on with this? Have you ever felt that way before? Where every, the, the circumstances just keep stacking up, doors keep closing, and you're just trying to do the right thing, and you're trying to honor God, and you're trying to, uh, to live into what he's called you to, but it can be, it can be frustrating and discouraging and, and, and at the same time, you know, I know I, I've had that experience. In fact, uh, when I first uh, was, was searching the Lord's call when leaving the Episcopal Church and coming into the Anglican Mission in the Americas at the time, uh, and uh, there was a bishop who took me under, Gracie and I, under his wing, and, uh, and he asked us, you know, well, what, what, what would you do? Like, what, what kind of ministry do you foresee? And I said, I, I think the Lord's calling us to plant churches. I think we have to be about this work. And he said, okay, well, if he's calling you to it, where do you think he's calling it to? And I said, I think it's in the, in the Jacksonville area. It's, uh, my heart is there. I grew up there. I know the people, and I think that's what... And he said, okay, great. He goes, go down there for a week, pray, meet people, and see what happens. And so that's what I did. He was willing to pay for it, too, by the way. Um, <laughs> And so he sent me down, and I prayed, and I met, and conversation led me to conversation and conversation, and eventually, uh, the, uh, the, through the work of what I believe, the Holy Spirit, it was obvious, I met uh, a group of folks out at the beach who had left various churches, and, and they were getting, start, getting something started and had a passion to see uh, a faithful Anglican expression at the beach, and I met with them, and I thought, this is what the Lord's doing. I wrote a report uh, for, the, for the bishop, and I was all excited that this is what the Lord's doing. Well, as we took the next couple steps through it, the Lord closed the door at that time. And I was, I was pretty upset about it. Uh, I was like, I don't understand why at this time, but the Lord then directed us somewhere else, and we were there for, for a couple years uh, when, I'm, through someone else that I met, the Holy Spirit was working and said, hey, you know that group at the beach that, that you met with? I said, yeah. And he goes, I think it's time. I think it's the, the right, the timing's right now. 
I said, whoa, I thought that was done. I thought that door had been closed. But the Holy Spirit opened it up. It opened it up again and, and to the, you know, what, who could have known two years later that he'd open it up and, and we'd be called to come down and to join the, this wonderful group and to what's grown now here uh, 16 years later from then to what we, where we are now at Church of Our Savior. Praise the Lord. But you, I couldn't see it in, in, in that first prohibition. And it's often hard when we, when we see that first prohibition and experience, experience it. Uh, that, that there's some greater permission that's coming, that we just can't maybe see it in the moment. But we have to be patient and wait on the Lord to work because he has something in mind, which brings us to, to verse 8. In verse 8, we're, we're, told, uh, we're told this. So passing by Mycenae, they went down to Troas, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. The Holy Spirit here, after forbidding them and not allowing them, prohibiting them from going where they thought they wanted to go, is now giving an amazing new permission to go in a direction that they had not imagined, a place they had not planned on going, a new direction into Macedonia, one that's going to prove to be incredibly fruitful uh, for, the, for the gospel mission that they're on. The closed door of prohibition, the Spirit often uses that to guide us then to a new and better plan for the mission and purposes that he has for us. You know, I think this works practically in our lives as well, doesn't it? Uh, Where the prohibition leads to actually something better that we never could have imagined. Uh, And even if, when I say better, I don't mean that we're happier, uh, but I mean that there's something more meaningful, more purposeful. There's, There's something that we can see the hand of God is on this that I never could have seen before. You know, the truth is, and Hayes, I probably should have told you I was going to share this. This isn't about you. Don't worry. Um... (laughs) But, you know, two times before I, I met Gracie, I thought that I had m- met the woman that I was going to marry. Two times before. I'm sure you've had this experience before, right? Uh, and two times the Lord, the Holy Spirit prohibited it. And it, it, at the time, I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. And it, w- it was frustrating. It was painful. But then when I met Gracie, the, the Holy Spirit granted permission. And, and it's been amazing. It's not easy. It's not easy, but it's, uh, but it's amazing, and it's beautiful that what he's, God's doing for his purposes for the gospel, because you know what? That's what marriage is for. Marriage is, yes, for, for our procreation and for the mutual enjoyment and edification and building each other up, but marriage is also about God choosing to bring two sinners together, and the fact that they could ever get along and actually be married is the greatest example of his grace that you could ever possibly imagine to the rest of the world. And I never could have possibly imagined at the time when the Holy Spirit prohibited to what he actually had in store for me later on with Gracie, for the joy and for the work of his kingdom. So at times there's, there's prohibition, but the prohibition leads to a beautiful and powerful permission for the work that God has for us in store. And and then the Holy Spirit guides us through perception. Okay, this is the point where I think I might have pushed it a little bit on the P's. Um, So after after prohibition and permission, uh, through, through new vision, verse 10 tells us this. And when Paul had seen the vision... Immediately, we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. All right, so this perception uh, that that I'm using, it really is discernment, but the D didn't didn't sound as good with the P's. Um, uh, It's discernment is the way that God guides us. The Holy Spirit's guide guided uh, Paul through a vision, right? A a vision that he had. Uh, He had this dream of this man from Macedonia saying, come on over and help us. And God, the Holy Spirit used this vision this, and often prophetic words that, uh, to help us and to encourage us and to help guide us. But those kind of things, the visions and, and the dreams and the prophetic words, uh, they all can be incredibly powerful, but they have to be discerned. 
They have to be discerned, and they have to be discerned together with other people. It's not just your, if you receive the vision, if you receive the prophetic word, it needs to be affirmed and discerned by others so that you know this just wasn't your idea. <laughs> this wasn't just your grand idea. We're all called to, uh, we're not called to check our brains at the door. Uh, that's not what the Holy Spirit wants for us. We're not called just to, to follow a person who claims to have been given a vision by God. They may have. The Holy Spirit does work that way. Acts shows us. But we have to discern it together to know if this is good and right and what the Lord is doing. Because we're told here that they concluded. They concluded. The word means assuredly together. To infer something together from a variety of data. And so Paul shared with them the, the, the dream that he had of what was happening. And they sat down together. And they discerned it. They per perceived it. They perceived what was going on and what the Holy Spirit might be doing in there. They then could look back and see the prohibition. And now they're see, hearing this vision like, well, this must be what the Holy Spirit is doing. We can affirm this together. We believe it. You know, we're sinful people. We're sinful people. And so sometimes our prophetic word, our vision, isn't from God. Sometimes it's just our own idea. We have to be able to admit that. If we're going to welcome and embrace the fullness of the guidance of the Holy Spirit and, and prophetic word and at times visions and all the beautiful things we see happening in Acts, we all have to be able to accept that we might be wrong. It's when you think that you can discern it all by yourself and you can declare it to be true and that you could never possibly be wrong, it's no longer the guidance of the Holy Spirit at all. It's now just a sinful desire to manipulate uh, others and to be right yourself. We have to discern. You know, it's the same thing with this sermon and every sermon that you ever hear. Your job isn't just to take it and to assume, well, you know, he's the voice of God. You know, you know, you know it might be, but, you know. <laughs> but you should never accept that. You have to together discern it. You have to discern it. Is this the word of God? Is this true to what God is saying? Or is it not? <laughs> I'm not asking you to check your brain at the door, and we shouldn't either. And the Holy Spirit doesn't want us to. The Holy Spirit wants us to discern together what he's doing, to be encouraged, to hear that prophetic word when it's given and be able to affirm this is true and this is good and this is right and this is what the Holy Spirit is doing. It's a beautiful thing when we can... Uh, we're guided by the Holy Spirit and discern that together and receive that with joy and encouragement. And then finally, the Holy Spirit guides us through permission. Permission. And we see that. I'm not going to read the whole section. Uh, but in that next section of Paul now, them living into the call to Macedonia, having been prohibited, having then uh, been, uh, been you know, given the, the permission to go, um, the permission to go, they, they received that, uh, having now mutually discerned that together. Um, now they are, the Holy Spirit is guiding them through persuasion. I may have said permission before, but the, four, the fifth is, uh, the fourth is persuasion. And we see that happening in Lydia. Uh, as they go and they minister and they proclaim the gospel, uh, to this, by the way, probably very prominent woman. She was a, a dealer, uh, a dealer of, uh, of purple, and uh, therefore uh, she was someone who would have been uh, someone who was important. She would have been someone who had a, a real place and means uh, in her community. But but listen to what to what we're told uh, in verses uh, about in verses fourteen. In verse fourteen, we're told one who. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Theatra, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Did you hear that part? The Lord opened her heart to be able to hear the words, the gospel that Paul proclaimed. It was the Holy Spirit 
the Lord who did that work in her life so she could even receive it. Well, what does that mean? Well, we, we heard about it in our gospel reading, didn't we? Uh, in, in John 16, verses uh, 8 to 10. If you can't remember, I'll read it for you again. And when he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. That word convict, it also means to convince, to persuade. And so, so what we're being told here is the Holy Spirit's the one who's actually at work persuading hearts to hear the gospel, to receive it, meaning to recognize themselves that they're sinners in need of God's saving grace. But then, but then hearing and being convinced of the righteousness of Jesus and that he's gone to be with the Father and that our righteousness is in him alone and not in ourselves. And finally, concerning judgment, that the ruler of this world has been judged, that the final judgment has been rendered, that we have been saved through the victory of Jesus Christ through the cross. The Holy Spirit does that work of persuasion, of convincing. What good news that is for us. That all our job is to do is to proclaim. Proclaim in word and deed the gospel to others. It's not our job whether we can convince them or not. We can't convince them. All we can do is present it in a loving way, in a compassionate way. Speaking the truth in love, which sometimes is tough love but more often is with grace and compassion. And it's the Holy Spirit's work to guide them and to open their hearts so they might receive the gospel in their own hearts and receive Jesus. The Spirit of Jesus is at work guiding our lives right now, just as the Holy Spirit was at work guiding the early church. And in this passage, and with Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke, as they're on mission for him through prohibition and permission and perception and persuasion. He's doing that in us and for us and always leading us to Jesus. The Father has given all things to Jesus and the Holy Spirit is working to always proclaim that truth and to drive us back to him. Jesus said, it's to your advantage that I go away. You know, that's one of the most perplexed, another P. That's one of the most perplexing thing, passages in all of Scripture that I can imagine. How is it better? How is it to our advantage that Jesus goes away? How can it be to our advantage that the Son of God, our Messiah, wouldn't still be here with us? After the resurrection, of course. But Jesus said, it's to your advantage that I go, for if I don't go, the Helper won't come to you. But if I go, I will send him. I will send him to you. And friends, we all need the helper. We need the help. We need times of being prohibited from making decisions that that aren't good for us and aren't in accordance with God's good and perfect and pleasing plan for our lives. We need those moments of beautiful permission to take that next step and to experience the, the joy of what God has in store for us. We need the, the, the perception. We need one another uh, to, to mutually discern what the Holy Spirit's doing in our lives so that we can trust it, that this isn't just an idea of man, that this is the work of God in our lives and trust it and move forward. And finally, we need his work of persuasion in our own hearts, making us aware of our own sin making us aware of our righteousness, which is secure in Christ when we put our faith in him and that his victory is assured for us. But also, we need the persuasion that it's not our job to convict the hearts of others, but that he's at work drawing people. As, as Jesus said, that, uh, that God's the one who's drawing people to himself can trust the Holy Spirit. He's at work in our lives. He is guiding us as we so desperately need. Amen.